afternoon, everyone. Welcome once again to Great Atlanta Seventh-day Adventist Church. Hope you're ready for a message today that the Lord has given. We pray that it will be a blessing and that will give you the instruction that we so need today. Before we begin, let's set up the context for how we're going to come into today's, um, lesson today, in today's message today. The Israelites, they finally make it into the promised land. The Lord parted the Jordan and they cross it. They won battle after battle. They watched the Lord do amazing things, like causing the sun and moon to stand still for about a whole day. Joshua divided the land between the tribes. All they had to do was keep fighting until they claimed it all, and it was theirs. He also gave them the choice, worship the gods of Egypt, or worship the gods of their Amorite neighbors, or worship the Lord. The generation that was born in the wilderness, having experienced themselves the fruits of faithfulness and faithlessness, chose to serve the Lord. Then Joshua died. Then that faithful generation died. Now there arose another generation, a generation that didn't know the Lord or his works for the people. We are experiencing the rise of a generation of Christians that does not know the Lord. In earlier generations, the church took great care to raise their children up in the way of the Lord. Various accounts in our history testify of this. But as time passed, the standard lowered. With true godly examples of faith parenting, it's the uh, next generation, it seems hard to think that the next generation would drop the ball. What would cause them to do this? Why is this newer generation of Christians less Christian? Today's message is titled, A Generation That Knows Not the Lord. Before we begin, let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you this day, this Sabbath day, Lord, seeking a word from on high. Lord, we need to answer this question, well, not only the why, but what can we do? Without you, Lord, we can't do anything. And we ask you through your grace, Lord, that this message will burn as fire in our hearts, that we be motivated, inspired to take up the, the work, Lord, and do what you're going to do, to seek that deeper experience. We pray in Jesus' name. Help us Lord, we'll see it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you noticed some things about this next generation of Christians? They are more tolerant of sin. The things we were told to avoid as children are not being avoided today. The music is different. It's not all bad, but it's not all good either. The study of the Bible isn't where it should be as a priority in their lives. But the most distinctive issue we're facing right now is the rise of culture in shaping the religious beliefs and lives of the believers. The shifting sand of culture is telling Christians what is and what isn't acceptable, what is good and what is evil. This is a serious issue. A culture that knows not the Lord is slowly turning the next generation of Christians away from the Lord, away from the Bible. In the days of ancient Israel, the next generation of Israelites after Joshua and the elders after him turned from God entirely. Let's turn to the book of Judges, chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. That's Judges 2, 11 to 13. And it reads, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Israel, that nation that God delivered from slavery, by the ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea, found more value in the idols of wood, stone, gold, silver, and brass that did nothing, nothing to bring them out of slavery. The land that they were now living in, it did nothing to bring them into the land they were now living in. The Canaanites' ways were more attractive to the Israelites than God's. Even though God told them 
in Leviticus 18 through 20 that the ways of the Canaanites polluted the land. Attraction. That's what led the Israelites to learn their ways, the way they worshiped, the way they lived, the way they dressed. They were ways that were foreign to a holy people. Israel became enticed. They reached for the forbidden fruit and they ate it. They ate more and more of it. They had so much you couldn't tell them apart from the idolaters, but God could. The people bowing down to these images were his people. They were the children of faithful generations that fought for the promised land. This generation did not know the Lord. They needed to have their own experience in this faith. They needed to come to the Lord for themselves and personally experience the Lord's power to save. Let's look at a little further here in the book of Judges, chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them, for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them. And they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. The Lord withdrew his protection from the Israelites and their land. When, they, when he did this, all the enemies of the Lord distressed the people. When they did, the Israelites cried out to the Lord and he heard them. He delivered them. Over and over through the book of Judges, the Israelites Generations of Israelites, they apostatized, they suffered, they repented, and they were delivered. For that delivered generation, the time of distress was enough. They had the experience of a life without God, and they wanted no more, no more of it. The next generation of Christians needs an experience with God. They need to experience this power to save for themselves. It's not enough for their parents to have had an experience. They need to see the Bible's words come to life in their own lives. They need a unique experience that will meet them where they are. But how can they get it? What will it take for them to stay true to God here and in the coming crisis? Let's do a little reading. Let's go to Matthew 7, verse 7. Matthew 7, verse 7. Let's go there. And it reads, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Instead of turning to culture to deepen your faith, ask Jesus to deepen it. After you ask him, you better buckle up. It's going to meet you where you are. You may be addicted to alcohol, pregnant in high school, going to juvie, tired of living. Wherever you are, if you're in need of a deeper experience, ask Jesus for a deeper experience. Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 25 through 27. That's Luke 13, 25 through 27. Luke 13, 25 through 27 reads, When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And ye shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. One of the reasons a lot of people will be lost is because they never knew Jesus. If they did, they would never turn from him. We can sit in a church, listen to every sermon, and not connect with the Son of Man. If you want to know him, read the Gospels. Who was Jesus as a person, as a teacher? How did he treat the people who hated him? Was he happy? Was he sad? Was he angry? Get to know him. Talk to him. He can hear you. You're not talking to a book. You're not talking to the air. You're not talking to a figment of what you think Jesus looks like or what you think he's like. A lot of testimonies start when people talk to Jesus. 
Jesus is and always will be countercultural. When sin abounded in his time, he, didn't, he met the people where they were, but he never took part in their sins. He didn't have to act like a publican to win a publican. He didn't have to sleep with a prostitute to win a prostitute. He didn't enable them in their sinful life. He just showed them a better way. I'm going to read a quote to you, which you're familiar with, maybe you're familiar with by now, from the Ministry of Health and Healing, page 73. And it reads, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with people as one who desired their good. He showed sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he invited them, follow me. The Christian church has fallen for the same doctrine that corrupted the church in earlier times. In the first few centuries AD, the church sought to win people by assimilating the pagan elements of their culture. Making this compromise led to the gradual corruption of the Christian faith. When this happened, when this happened the Christian church became a persecuting power that ushered in an era of spiritual darkness for 1,260 years. Before it was corrupted, the Christian church always gave people the choice whether or not to serve God. The world, however, always gave the mandate to worship their gods or die. The Babylonian Empire did it. The Medo-Persian Empire did it. The Grecian Empire did it. The pagan Roman Empire did it. In certain parts of the Middle East and Africa, in China and North Korea, among other countries, this is still happening. Before Jesus returns, it will happen worldwide. The world will be mandated by law to worship God on Sunday or die. The people Satan will use to do this, the church, the church will again become a persecuting power. For the church to become a persecuting power again, it must become corrupt. It happened before, it's happening now, and before Jesus returns, it will happen again. The culture we're in right now is incredibly hostile to the Christian faith. It can turn a child against their parents. It can groom them to engage in sexual exploration. It can incite drug use, violent crime, mass murder, destruction of property, teen pregnancy, the list goes on. It can educate you to adopt oppositions of science falsely so-called, 1 Timothy 6, verse 20. It can convert you to any faith outside of Christianity. You can leave your home a Christian and come back something completely different if you're not careful. One would think that Christians would resist or avoid such an ungodly culture, but what we are seeing right now is the exact opposite. The experience we're having in the world is having a far greater influence on us than the experience that we're having right now with God. We need a deeper experience. But what will it take before we actually pursue one? Will it take the coming crisis, a mission trip to a country hostile to Christianity, the loss of everything we have and everyone we know? How much of a beat down do we need before we start looking up again? What will it take for you? What will it take for you to cry out to the Lord to save you? We really need to think about that. If you die, Without that deeper experience, you could be lost. You could hear, depart from me at the final judgment. You're not in the kingdom until you're in the kingdom. How many people will we see in the final judgment who will have died before they acted on the conviction to repent? If God called you before you, watch, you start watching this message, then get on your knees and talk to him right now. I mean that, seriously. Just pause the video. We'll be here. Just pause, talk to God, and come right back, okay? God sent saviors to deliver his people from the cultures that oppressed them in the time of the judges. The men and women God raised up to save Israel were people just like us. They had flaws, but they obeyed him. They did what he said, and when they did, 
Israel was saved. God saves people in a lot of ways. In the time of the judges, it took armed conflict. In our times, it takes revivals, prophecy and health seminars, genuine friendships, foreign missions. It takes circumstances that require divine intervention. It takes dangerous, sometimes life-threatening situations. Sometimes it just takes a personal revelation, a still small voice, a song sung with meaning in a worship service or online. Being delivered from trials, addictions, and crises in our finances, our health, our marriage, should lead us to praise God. He made a way where none existed. Where none existed. Getting the answer to your prayers is a cause to rejoice. The prayer for a deeper experience with Jesus, however, not only calls for praise, it calls on us to act. We have to do something. A deeper experience with God calls on us to change something. Our worldview, our habits, our thoughts, our words, things must change. When the things that must be changed, added, and or discarded are revealed to us by the Lord, we must obey his directions. We don't like to talk about this part of the Christian faith. Turning from the things that we do know, say, and think is a crucial part of our faith. Believing and acknowledging that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, believing he saved us, that's the first step, not the final one, towards coming closer to God. Surrender is the word. There are things in our life that separate us from God, and we must surrender them. If the Lord is calling you to surrender something, it must be something that is keeping us, keeping you from a deeper relationship with him. Let it go. Leave it be. Nothing we're called to surrender is worth more than a deeper relationship with God. It's not worth fighting God to keep. Let's go to the book of Romans now, chapter 7, verse 20, verses 22 through 24. That's Romans, everyone. Romans chapter 7, verses 22 through 24. And it reads, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity into the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? We want to do it. But part of us doesn't want to surrender. This is where we need divine power, divine strength to put it down. We need to pray for the strength to surrender and to move forward. Every time you gain the victory, you get more strength to surrender to something else. Eventually, you'll be able to sing that hymn, I Surrender All, with greater emphasis because you did it. A deeper experience with God means that you have to experience some things. Whatever comes your way, know that it will help you get closer to him. Good and bad things each have their role to play in deepening your faith. They will show you what you need to work on, what you need to focus your life on, what you need to learn about, etc. These experiences are not only for you. They are for the people that the Lord wants you to help. Let's go to the book of 2 Corinthians. And let's look at chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. As 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. And it reads, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of our mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Our experiences in the faith are how we connect with others. The next generation of Christians need a deeper experience with the Lord. The current generation needs one too. The greatest obstacle to the younger generation's faith is the generation before it. We set the example for the next generation. When they see our faithlessness, 
our hypocrisy, our judgmental mindset, our refusal to obtain a deeper experience with God that will correct these things, we're doing more to turn the next generation of Christians from the Lord than the ungodliness of Western culture. We cannot waste any more time lamenting the decline of Christianity in the West. We need to be revived and reformed so our children can look up to us again. If you're judging your teen, stop judging your teen. If you're saying one thing and doing another, stop that. If you're being unfaithful in your marriage, in your spiritual life, you need to deal with these things. The next generation has seen and experienced our imperfections for far too long. We've played a role, whether or not we want to admit it, in making the next generation of Christians less Christian. What are we going to do to help fix it? We're watching the Christian faith change before our very eyes, and not all for the better. Bible prophecy told us that it was going to happen. The next generation of Christians, they need to have a deeper experience with the Lord that they'll be used by the powers that be to persecute the world. That experience will help them rise above this, like the influence of this culture, that deeper experience that, above this culture that hates God, hates Jesus. That experience will not be easy, but it will save their lives here and hereafter. If we want them to have it, we need to have it ourselves. Be the Christian you want your children to be. If you're part of that up-and-coming generation of Christians, you probably have a lot of questions. You're probably feeling very cynical towards Christianity. You're probably done wrong by many people who profess to be Christian. Don't let what happened to you turn you away from God. Don't let culture tell you how to be a better Christian. Find out what it means to be a better Christian yourself. Ask Jesus for a deeper experience. Ask him questions and where in the Bible you can find those answers. I'm not going to just tell you to read the Bible. I'm going to ask you to get your own answers. Let's pray and ask God together. Because young and old, we need answers. We need a deeper relationship with God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for helping us see our need of a deeper experience. We need an experience that goes beyond just the standard, beyond what we are used to seeing, the one that doesn't change us. We need the experience, Lord, that will root us in the faith, an experience, Lord, that is stronger than any relationship, an experience, Lord, that will set our feet on the right path and keep us walking down it. We pray, Lord, that you meet us where we are, that that experience that it will do in our lives what we need it to do, to change us for the better and to show us, O oh Lord, how we can pass it on to others and to our, the next generation. Help us, Lord, to seek that we may find today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a happy Sabbath. If you have any questions or any comments, leave them, leave them, in the, leave them below. Take care. Mm-hmm.